pleasant day to you, our beautiful viewers, and welcome to Women on the Watch, powered by the Shapers Act. Women on the Watch is aimed at exposing time-tested principles for practical application to personal and relationship development matters. I am Wonola Adetayo, the Shaper. Our series on the family has the objective of helping families to draw closer to God and thereby foster a just and God-fearing society. Today's episode is particularly written concerning today's world, which is troubled because of failures emanating from the family. It is our fervent belief that if we can successfully fix the family, then we can fix our communities, we can fix the world, and all will be well with us in our nations. To every one of you who has sent us questions or comments, or indeed some of you who have purchased our books, we want to say a very, very big thank you to you. And if for one reason or another, you have not received our response, then we encourage you to connect with us again via WhatsApp and we assure you that we will respond accordingly. Today's episode is titled, Building Your Family on the Rock. We shall be taking two scripture passages. First, we will take Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, as well as Luke chapter 6, verse 48. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. The second passage, Luke 6, 48. He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the steam beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are thankful to you for another opportunity to study at your feet. Holy Spirit, you are the great teacher. We ask, Holy Spirit, that we reveal unto us the deep secrets about the way in which families can be built upon the rock so that when the storms come and when the rains come, our families will indeed stand and stand tall. This is our heart cry to you, Holy Spirit, and we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our case study is the story of Isaac's family. Isaac's family's story can be seen in Genesis 24, verse 67, all the way to Genesis 35, verse 29. Isaac and Rebekah, as a family, they followed God's command to marry and to have children. They both sought and received parental approval and blessings as they entered into the institution of marriage. Both husband and wife had strong and individual personal relationships with the Almighty God. As a good husband, Isaac observed that his wife, Rebecca, was experiencing delayed childbearing. And the Bible records that Isaac interceded with God for his wife in Genesis chapter 25, verse 20. Isaac did not abandon his wife in her hour of need. He saw the problem of delayed pregnancy as a family challenge and he presented the matter to God in prayer. Furthermore, Rebecca demonstrated as a wife and mother her personal intimate relationship with God because she asked God concerning his plans for the children when they were yet unborn in her womb. This you can find in Genesis 25 and verse 23. God answered Rebekah without hesitation to show 
the personal intimacy that she had as a wife and as a, as a mother with her God. This couple, they were not devoid of their own personal flaws. As parents, because you could see Isaac loved the firstborn son Esau, whilst Rebekah loved Jacob, the second son. Perhaps because of what God had shared with her about the plan for the secondborn son. Rebekah, unfortunately, overreached herself, trying to help God to accomplish what God did not send her to do. She connived with Jacob to deceive her husband, and that way, the husband at that time was blind. And that way, Jacob was able to extract the firstborn blessing that was meant for Esau through the connivance of the mother. Now, this led to a terrible rift between the brothers. Thank God it was later resolved. Isaac, as a human being, also lied about his relationship with his wife when they were in the land of the Philistines. Yet, God helped him out of this difficult situation, leaving the wife, Rebecca, unharmed and untouched. This couple, in spite of these little frailties of their lives, they remained committed to each other and to the institution of marriage. They also remained committed to their family institution, despite these personal challenges and failures. Isaac turned out to be a hard-working, diligent and persistent husband and father. He worked so hard that he produced so much wealth that the whole nation envied him. Isaac also set a wonderful example of personal resilience as a father because he kept on digging wells until there was no more contention when he got to Rehoboth. No wonder both his sons, Esau and Jacob, they all ended up to be huge successes in life because they had a rich parental legacy left by both the father and the mother. Isaac not only passed on the legacy of hard work, diligence, persistence, and resilience to his sons, he also passed on spiritual legacy of personal intimacy with God, as we could see Jacob also communing with God, and he ended up with a change of name to Israel for his covenant destiny to be fulfilled. We will also notice even the firstborn Esau, he wept bitterly because he knew the importance of securing the blessing of his father. And even though he got a remnant of the fatherly blessings, he also became an eventual big success. Our prayer for you today is that every family, God will grant us the grace to build our families in a godly manner and to leave good parental legacies of righteousness, of prosperity, and of a closer work with God for our children and for generations that are coming behind us. Welcome back. What a beautiful family to emulate. Like a normal couple, the parents, Isaac and Rebecca, they had their personal flaws, but they, that did, did not reduce them to issues of violence or fights or divorce or separation. They stayed through. They worked through their challenges. Each partner learned how to forgive and move on with their lives. Even the siblings overcame the manipulative tactics of the junior brother and they reconciled themselves and their families. It is such a delight to look at this family. And therefore, in today's episode titled Building Your Family on the Rock, we shall consider three Bs. First, the builder. Second, the building process. And third, the building blocks. But before we do this, let's take a break. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back soon. Of all the journeys of life, the journey to marriage is one of the most significant journeys that can make or mar one's destiny. In her book, Pitfalls on the Journey to Marriage, Pastor Wanuola Adetayo provides a treasure trove of godly wisdom and scriptural principles to guide Christians on the journey to a fulfilling and lasting marriage. 
wherever you are on the journey to marriage, this book is a manual and reference material with divinely inspired guidance that is certain to help you avoid those dangerous pitfalls that can disrupt your journey to marriage, your marital life, your destiny and ultimately your lot in eternity. Get your copy in print and electronic formats from your favorite online retailer or visit theshapersarc.org slash books to place an order. So we start by looking at the builder. And in this particular section, we seek to answer the question, who exactly is the builder of the family? Because every house has a builder that is appointed. Brethren, God is the only true builder of a solid family. Marriage union is not a physical structure. It is a spiritual structure because Ephesians 5.32 tells us that marriage is a mystery. You can't unravel it as a human being. Therefore, God is the builder, God is the protector, and God is the defender, as we are told in Psalm 127, verse 1. It says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wicked, but in vain. You see, human wisdom will fail in building that house. Ungodly tactics that a lot of people use today, manipulation in the home, deception, cheating, lying, all of these tactics, they will fail woefully. They can't build that structure. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 14, verse 42, it says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So there is no point trying to do it on our own. Adam and Eve, they tried their way, but they failed woefully in the Garden of Eden and caused problems for mankind. Abraham and Sarah, they also tried to help God. They tried their way. It only created sorrow. It only created pain for generations coming behind them. So human wisdom in building the world will fail. It's only God. The Bible says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Praise God. See, who is the builder? Only God can build that house on the rock. Because the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, they are vain. According to 1 Corinthians, they are vain. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. Lastly, some people may be saying, if God is the builder, what is the role of the husband and wife? Well, husband and wife are co-builders with God. Now, because God is the author of the union, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 28, he is the one who has the master design. But God uses the hands of both husband and wife as co-builders to build the family. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 to 13, and the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which thou art building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So you see, when you build with God, not only... Will he protect you? He will also dwell with you. So when couples build together with God, they have God with them in their home. They have God with them on their journey. Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. And are built up foundations of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all building fitly framed together growth into an holy temple in the Lord, which is what our homes and our families are supposed to look, look like, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So when we build with God, when couples build with God, that union, one, is God's building. Two, he is the builder, the master builder. The couple, they are the co-builders. And when we follow his pattern, that union will stand secure no matter the storm. Which takes us to the second B, the building process. 
the building process. Now, in this section, we seek to answer the question, what is the building process of the family? Because there is a step-by-step -step process of building the family. So we need to understand because a lot of marriages are cracking and scattering nowadays because people forget that building a family comes in phases, comes in stages. It is not a dash. It is a marathon race that requires understanding and requires wisdom. The Bible says in Proverbs 24 and verse 3, through wisdom is an house builded and by understanding it is established. The process of building a family can be divided into four stages. Four stages of building your family on the rock. Stage one, that is the honeymoon stage. Stage two is the awakening stage. Stage three is the acceptance stage. And stage four is the actualization stage when we truly begin to look exactly as that holy temple that God designed us to be. How beautiful it will be if all of us can just build with God this beautiful edifice that he wants to make of our families. As we go to the last bit, we want to look at the building blocks of a family. Now, in this section, we're looking at what are the materials and the ingredients that are put together in the building process. And there are six, and they spell the word family. F is for forever. A is for agreement. M is for management. I is for involvement. L is for love. Y for yieldedness. Family. So we'll take each one in quick succession. Forever. What does that mean? It means fix your mind that this marital journey is until death. Mark chapter 10 verse 9. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Because of that, focus all your effort to make it work. Because Malachi 2 verse 16 already tells us that God hates putting away. He hates divorce. He hates separation. That's not his desire. Just fix your mind on the word Tina. There is no alternative. Once you have done that, the next thing, ingredient in that building process is agreement. Amos 3.3. 3. Can two work together except they be agreed? No, you got to be agreed. And the reason why there must be agreement is because in the absence of agreement, the house will collapse. Mark chapter 3 verse 25 says, and if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. A home that is in agreement is a formidable force. And that's why the devil likes to make sure husband and wife disagree with themselves because he knows he can cheat them of their blessings. Deuteronomy 32, 32 30. One will chase a thousand and two will put 10,000 to flight. And you know the most interesting one, when the couple will also have the Holy Spirit in their midst. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So agreement is a crucial ingredient. Then management. Management is important. <laughs> we got to learn to manage ourselves. That is self-management first. Husband must know how to manage himself. Wife must know how to manage herself. Playing their roles and also managing their expectations, managing their personalities, managing their differences. There's no point husband trying to convert the wife to become like you. No, God brought you together because you are different. And there's no point wife trying to convert husband to be like you. No, maximize the benefit that lie in your differences. Then you, you must manage money. Many homes today, in fact, is one of the uh, three top reasons why marriages are failing in ability to manage money. Follow the principles of God in managing your money. Tithes and offerings, don't joke with it. Emergency fund, have it aside because our, our money does not respect anointing. Go and ask the wife, the widow of the, of the prophet. Money doesn't respect anointing. Have emergency funds that is the equivalent of your six months living expense that you have kept aside in case the flood of finance comes, then you'll be able to survive. And then learn to abound, learn to abase. Don't, don't, don't save after you have spent. No, save before you spend. Then manage the members of your family. Let's look at the number four ingredient in building 
uh, our home on the rock. Involvement. Involve husband and wife in decision making. Involve family members in your vocation. Don't let them be completely strangers to the things that you do at work so you don't create suspicion. When you are on the way to work, your wife should be able to call you and get you. When you are in your office, your husband should be able to know your colleagues. Get your family members involved in decision making, involved in your vocation, and both husband and wife should be involved in parenting. We did not hear of Eli's wife. That is why trouble came to their family. And then, of course, please, leisure is very important. Find times to go on break, to relax together as a family. Then, number five ingredient, and a very, very crucial ingredient, love. You need to change your thinking about love if you want to survive, if you want to succeed, if you want to thrive as a family. Love is not a feeling. It's a decision. Love is a choice. Love is a commitment, unconditional. Once you make up your mind, the love will be the pillars that will hold that home together. And this thing about love, there are five universal languages. You need to know them. Which one is my wife's own? Which one is my husband's own? Which one is my children's own? So that you then relate with them in the language that they understand. Word of affirmation is a love language. Acts of kindness is a love language. Quality time is a love language. Giving of gifts is a love language. So we need to learn which one does my husband speak, which one does my wife speak, and speak to them in the language that they understand. And of course, we talked about the phases of development of the family. We must understand whether it, we are in the acceptance phase or we are in the stormy phase. That way, we can then apply the correct solutions, which takes us to the last ingredient, the sixth building block, and that is yieldedness. Yieldedness is so crucial. Why? Because God is the builder of the, of, the, of the family. He is the author of the family. We must connect with him. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, even Revelation 3, 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus will not get crashed into your home. At the marriage in Cana of Galilee, he was invited. So connect with him by studying the word, by giving your life to Jesus and inviting him to take over and run your family. Then importantly, communicate with him in prayers, in family altar, and finally, act on what he said. That's where we started from the very beginning. He who hears these words, not just the hearing, but doeth them. Act on his laws, act on his commands, and then you suddenly find that this house is not only having foundation, and the foundation comprises of forever and agreement. It has walls. The walls are management and involvement. It has pillars. The pillars that hold the house, they are called love. And then finally, the roof that serves as a complete covering is the yieldedness to the almighty God. Now, is it possible? Matthew 19, 26 says, with men, this is impossible, but... With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. So I want to believe, according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, he says, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, the, do them, and then the God of peace shall be with you. So at the end of the day, make a decision. Brethren, your future is created by what you do today, not Tomorrow, the Bible tells us, John 2, verse 10, and that's my prayer for you and I, that God, when he looks down to our families, he will say, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. It is possible for that good wine to be renewed in all of our homes. In summary, brethren, what have we discussed today? Number one, no one can succeed in building a strong family without being recreated by God. It's not possible. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Marriage is the physical representation of the relationship between Christ and his church. Therefore, 
marriage is also a visual representation of our eternal marriage as brides to our bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ. If you miss a joyful home on earth, oh Lord, you cannot afford to miss joy in eternity. And indeed, if you already have a joyful home on earth, how sad would it be for you to find yourself ending up in sorrow in eternity? What does that mean? If you have never given your life to Jesus, you need to give your life to him. You need to invite him into your home. You need to invite him into your family. There is no chance of success unless Jesus is your builder and is the cornerstone. Brethren, as we close on building your family on the rock today, we urge you to remember that success lies in obedience to God's word concerning families. We do sincerely recommend that you apply all the tips and techniques that we have outlined in this episode for building healthier, stronger families that will shine the light of God and positively impact societies for better. I urge you to connect with us. All our phone numbers and, and, and addresses are being shown on screen. Connect with us so that we can help you on this journey. I look forward to seeing you next week to share with you another exciting family episode on women on the watch powered by the shapers act till i come your way next week on another family based episode this is one all the shaper god bless you very richly